welcome you here again this morning. And I want to ask you if, uh, if you would pray with me as we get started this morning. God, we want to thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the blessings that you pour out on us, God. And we thank you so much for the love that you pour out on us, God. We thank you that we've had some wonderful voices this morning to lead us in worship, God. We thank you that uh, you do love us and that we can come before you and we can praise you, God. We pray this morning that you would open our hearts, open our minds to you. Speak through me, God. Get me out of the way and just speak. Let your word speak to us. And God, we just pray that you would just uh, do something great this morning. We praise you and love you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Not long ago, I was at a uh, deal where I was listening to a speaker, and he was, uh, actually, I think it was the men's conference. I don't remember if it was a men's conference or a pastor I was watching online, but he was going through, he was sharing the story about a, another speaker he had gone to. And he said the man had gone up, he had gotten up on the stage, and he said, okay, I want everybody here who has ever been uh, a starting athlete to stand up. I want everybody here that's, that's ever been on the, the starting lineup of a sports team, or you've, you've, you know, one of the top people in sports, I want to ask you to stand up. And they stood up, and then he went along and he said, all right, well, I want anybody that's been a valedictorian or a salutatorian, I want to ask you to stand up. And he went through and he, he would ask for people that, that had been the top, people that had been good, the people that had been the best, and they stood up. And he said, all right, I want us all to give a hand to these people, and let's, let's cheer them on for their, their achievements. And as they all stood up, he said, he said and I, I've got good news for you guys that are standing up right now. God can use you too. See, because his entire point was that God, throughout Scripture, reveals the fact that He's not looking for the people that are the best. He's not looking for the people that are the top. He's not looking for the politicians. He's not looking for the Billy Grahams. He's not looking for the, the, the person that has it all. He's not looking for them to change the world. God is looking for the everyday. God is looking for the average. God's looking for the person just trying to live their life, the person just trying to do their thing. God's looking for the person that never finished a college degree. God's looking for the person that finished their college degree and they're just trying to live their life. God's looking for the person that just goes to work every day just trying to provide for their family. God is looking for that person to change the world. Scripture tells us that God uses the, the simple things of the world to shame the, the, the great. God is looking for the average. Because God wants to make a point that God is going to take you and God is going to take the person that you are and God will change the world. Today, if you would, we're going to be looking, starting off, we're going to be looking in the book of Judges, chapter 6. And as you're turning there, a little bit of history for what's going on here is this is after the Israelites were in, uh, in Egypt and, and Moses came along and he, uh, God used him and there was the, the plagues on Egypt that ravaged the land and he led them up out of the, the sea, <laughs> through the Red Sea and then Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years and they died and then God sent the, in the next generation into the Holy Land and they conquered it. So that's where we're at right now. Israel's come up, this is a few, couple hundred years after Israel's left the promised land, or uh, has left, sorry, has left Egypt. They've conquered the promised land. They don't have a king yet. They're just all the 12 different tribes, and they're living in their land, and they're doing their thing. But they have this, this kind of habit. As they will go, and they've, they've conquered the land, and they get content, and they get into their own routine, and they kind of turn their back on God, and they decide they want to follow other gods, and they don't want to ignore God, and then they get into trouble, and then they'll call out to God, and God, save us, and God will send somebody, and God will rescue them and deliver them, and then the same thing will happen again. And that's where we get to this point in chapter 6, where Israel has gotten to the point where they're back at that point, where they've turned their back on God. They're in trouble again. There's a group called the Midianites who have who are basically oppressing them. They've, they've come in, and as the Israel tries to harvest their grain, every time they, the Midianites will wait until the harvest season, they'll look up for on the hilltops where these guys are threshing their grain, where when you take, they would harvest their grain and there would be chaff in it, like the stuff you don't want, and they would take the grain on hillsides and they would throw it up in the air 
and the wind would carry the lighter chaff away and the grain would fall back down. And they would go on the hillsides and the, the Israelites would do this after they harvested. Well, the Midianites would wait and when they saw them on the hillsides throwing this wheat in the air, they would, go, they would know that it was time and they would go in they would steal their grain. They would kill them. They would oppress them. And the Israelites are, have been going through this for a long time. They've been under this oppression. And then we go on and in verse 6... We get to the start of this story and we're introduced to the hero, the hero as it is. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian seven years. And the hands of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made them dens which in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, filled till the come into the Gaza. They left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Then they came up to their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for the multitude, for both they and their camels were there out without number, and they entered the land and destroyed it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So the Midianites, the Amalekites, have come in and they've, they've oppressed them. They've taken their stuff. The Israelites are, they've taken their livestock. The Israelites are hiding in holes. They're hiding in grounds. And then we get to this point. In verse 11, where we're introduced to the hero of our story. And it goes through and God has heard them. And in verse 11 we get there. And there came an angel of the Lord and he sat under an oak which was in Oprah that pertained unto Joaz and the Abrazite, the son of Gideon, threshing wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, mighty man of valor. So we're introduced to our hero, our mighty God that's going to deliver Israel. And when we're introduced to him, he's hiding in a hole. He's hiding in a hole in the ground, threshing his wheat, which it can't be easy because there's not much wind, there's not much stuff to carry away the chaff. And we're introduced to our hero, and he's just hiding in a hole. This is the guy God picked. And the thing is, we, we can look at Gideon, but really, what was Gideon doing? He was just trying to live his life. He was just trying to provide for his family. He was just trying to do his thing. What Gideon was doing was no different than a whole bunch of other people in Israel at that time. They were just trying to keep their heads down. He wasn't looking to change the world. He wasn't the smartest. He wasn't the bravest. He wasn't standing on the hill defying them you know, with sword in hand while he was threshing them. That wasn't who Gideon was. He was just a guy that wanted to live his life. And as he's seer, he's, he's in this hole, he's threshing this wheat. And this guy that's just trying to live his life, this angel of the Lord shows up and he says, Greetings, mighty man of valor. And how powerful a statement that is, because we already know just from this brief introduction of who Gideon is, before we even really know who he is as a person, there's nothing special about him. There's nothing special about what's going on with Gideon. There's nothing that makes him stand out, but God is saying, you're the mighty man of valor. See, so often today, that's us. So many of us, we're not looking to, to change the world. We're not looking to be the person that stands out. We're not looking to be the, the famous person on TV. We're not looking to be the person that's in the history books. We're just trying to live our lives. We're just looking to be that person that provides for our family. We're just looking to be that person that does what we can for the people around us. And that's who Gideon was. But God looked at him and he said, even you, you're the mighty man of valor. And Gideon would be that mighty man of valor because God had, was going to work through him. And that's what we're going to see here in just a minute is that Gideon was a mighty man of valor because of who was behind him, not because of who he was. So you're an everyday person, you're an average, you might be that average person just trying to keep your head down to live your life and do your thing. 
And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But guess what? God is looking at you today saying that you are a mighty person of valor. You are a mighty man or a woman of valor. And it's not because of who you are, but it's because of who stands behind you. And it goes on in this first part where he says, where he's greeted them. And, and Gideon, as he shows up, Gideon says, And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then there is this befallen us? And where be all the miracles which our fathers told us, saying, Did the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And so he does the same thing so many of us do. Gideon... Gideon, while keeping his head down and looking around, he saw that there was a world that was full of injustice. He saw that there was a world full of, full of wrong. He saw that there was a world full of hurt. There saw a world full of pain. And he was saying, God, do something. God, you see all this stuff going on? God, why is all this happening? Look at all this bad stuff. There are people starving. There are people hurting. There are people... That... Look at all this bad stuff. But then we get into this next part where he, he says, God, look at all this bad stuff. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Oh, I lost my place. And in verse 14, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go unto thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the, Israel, from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said to him, O oh my Lord, where is it with me that I shall save Israel? Hold, my family is poor, poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So in this part, Gideon starts off this conversation, and he says, Look at all this bad stuff in the world. God, when are you going to do something? When are you going to address all this? And God said... Oh, I'm going to. You see all that, that evil that you're pointing out, that stuff, that hurt, that pain you're pointing out? I'm sending you. <laughs> but then what's Gideon's response? Whoa, 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 whoa. Not, not me. I didn't mean send me. I meant send somebody else. Not me, God. Don't, no, 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 no. And I love this because how often does this represent us? We see all this stuff around us. Man, why isn't the church doing this? Man, we could really be reaching a lot of lost people if we go and do this. Man, there's a lot of hurt in this area. Why aren't, why aren't we going and taking apart? Why aren't we doing something there? And God says, you're right. Go do it. No, God, I didn't mean me. I meant somebody else. I meant, I meant the, the other people in church that do stuff. They should do it. I meant the church staff. They should go do it. I didn't mean me, God, not me. I'm just trying to be me. And here Gideon goes into all the expl explanations of why not me, God. See, Gideon goes on and he says, Hey, my, I'm the poorest family in Manasseh. I'm from the poorest family of Manasseh, and I'm the, the least. I'm the youngest even in my house. See, Manasseh was the tribe. There were 12 tribes of Israel, and Manasseh, through some stuff that had happened back in the book of Judges, Manasseh had ended up being almost destroyed. They're, they're one of the weakest tribes. They're the, the lowest group out of these 12 tribes. And he says, I'm even one of the poorest family, and I'm the least in my family. I can't do this. You don't want me, God. You can't use me, God. And often we, we like to do that. We're the people that like, do we have this natural tendency to make excuses of why we can't be? Why we can't be the one that does it? Why God can't use us? <coughs> why we shouldn't be the one to go? God, I'm too busy at work. God, I don't, I don't have enough knowledge in, in, in the Bible. God, I don't have a Bible degree. God, I'm too old. God, I'm too young. God, I'm just too busy. God, I can't because. And how often do we do that? We make up the excuses of why we can't. And tell God, you can't use me because of this. 
And in reality, what we're not in reality, what we're saying to God is not, God, you can't use me because of this. We're saying, God, I won't let you use me because of this. Because as we see here with Gideon, as God goes on and talks to him here in these next couple of verses, he makes the point that it's not about you, Gideon. It's not about what you're capable of. It's about what I am capable of. It's about what I can accomplish, and it's about what I will accomplish through you. But in the end, it took Gideon saying, you know what, yeah. Gideon didn't have the talents. He wasn't a mighty warrior. He was just a guy trying to live his life, keep his head down, and do his thing. But God said, I'm going to use you. Today, God's saying that same thing to so many in here. He's saying, I'm going to use you. And many of us, as God comes up and He says, I'm going to use you. You're going to be the one I'm going to use to change this world. You're going to be the one that sees the lost saved, to see evil defeated, to see the hurt healed. And we say, no, God. No, because, because, because. We lose sight of the fact that it's not about who we are. It's about who God is and what He wants to do in us. And he goes on and in the last part here in verse 16. God makes the declaration that makes it all, that, that wipes away all the excuses, wipes away all the things that he had come up with. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. That was God's answer to, to all these, to everything, to all these uh, excuses that Gideon was coming up with about him being the least, about his family being the poorest, about his tribe being the least. God's answer was, I will be with you. And guess what? That's the answer God has all the time to us when we give the excuses to, to God as to why we can't. We come up with all the best excuses. We come up with the best reasons of why we can't. And God's answer to all of that is, I will be with you. And the entire story of Gideon, as he goes on, and Gideon goes on, and he, he leads the people of Israel to victory, but the way he does it, as he goes through, Gideon sends out this call and Gideon sends out this call to all the people of Israel and he says, hey, we're going to go to war. And so several thousand people show up. And thousands upon thousands of people show up to go to war. And Gideon's like, yeah, I got an army. We're ready to go. Let's, let's, let's do this. And God says, no, no, that's, that's too much. I want you to tell everybody that's afraid to go home. And so Gideon goes and he says, all right, anybody that's afraid, you can go home. And most of his army leaves. And he leaves with just a few thousand. He says, all right, well, we've got a few thousand. We can still do this. And God says, nope, nope. I want you to go and take them out and get them all to, to the river and let them all drink. And the ones that lap the water like a dog, I want you to keep those and send everybody else home. And so Gideon goes and he does that and he's left with 300 men. And he takes those 300 men and they completely defeat the enemies of Israel and they deliver Israel. And the entire point of that story is God is making a point that Gideon, it's not about you. It's not about what Israel can accomplish. It's not about what that is. It's about you understanding that I am the one behind you. I am the one that's going to do it. I am the power. I am the one that will bring about victory. And so the question is today... Do we understand that? Do we believe that? Do we know that when God is calling us, do we know that when God is saying, you see the, the thing you see that needs to be done, I'm here behind you. Do we believe that? We're going to jump forward real quick 
to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And I've used this, for, I've used this chapter before, but if you've ever read much in Hebrews, you know this is one of the more famous books of the Bible. And this book right here deals with the heroes of the faith. It deals with the people who throughout Scripture are the champions. They're the ones that, that do the mighty things. They're the ones that change the world. They're the ones that do it. And we're going to take a look at several verses here, so kind of stick with me. But we're looking at Hebrews 11. We're starting off uh, in chapter 4. And it starts off and it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God's testimony of gifts, and by it being dead, yet he speaketh. But <laughs> by faith Enoch was translated that he had not seen death and was not found because God had translated him. For before the translation he had his testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for him that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of the great things had not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark, saving his house, in which he condemned the to world, and became the heir of the righteous by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he should be called out into a place which he should go, received an inheritance, obeyed, and went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, this, he sojourned in the lands promised in the strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with whom he promised. For he looked at a city which had foundations, those builders, his maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered a child. And when she passed age, she judged him faithful as promised. Therefore sprang the even of one, and him as good deed. So many starts of the sky's multitude, and the sands by which the sea shore are innumerable. Remember jumping down to verse 17. We're going to stay going. By faith Abraham, when he was tired, when he was tired offered up Isaac that he had received a tried by Abraham. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And when he had received the promise, offered up only his only begotten son, of whom it saith that Isaac his seed shall be called, accounting to God what was able to him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both his sons Joseph and worship, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made motivation, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandments concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, hid, hid, <coughs> when he was born, was hid for three months by his parents because they saw him a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. By faith, Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasure of the seasons, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, freed respect unto the re recompense of his reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept Passover, sprinkling the first blood. They said he destroyed the firstborn, should touch them. By faith they passed through the red tree on dry land, which the Egyptians uh, sang to do were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished <coughs> not with them that believed not, and she had received the spies. And what more shall I say? For the time would family to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, of Jeth of David also, and of Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promise, and stopped the mouth of lions. So that's a lot of verses and stuff, but I wanted to, real quick, I wanted to point out all these people, and I wanted to go through, and I wanted to show all these people that are in Hebrews 11. And I wanted to look at these people refer, who are mentioned here. And the first person that we come to is Abel. And Abel was just a farmer. He was nothing special. He was just a farmer. And yet God remembered him. <coughs> Enoch was just a guy that lived his life. And yet he was recorded just because he came to love God so. We don't even know much about Enoch other than he came to know God. Noah was just a family man trying to do the right thing. And God said, I'm going to use you. To save the world. Abraham was just a <coughs> was just a shepherd that became a nomad. There was nothing special about him. Abraham and Sarah were both just an elderly couple trying to live their lives and hope for a child. Jacob was just a common thief who stole his birth who stole his brother's birthright. Joseph was just a slave and a prisoner. Moses' mother was just a woman who loved her child and wanted to do the right thing. 
Moses was just a pampered rich kid turned into a murderer, turned into a shepherd. The Israelites were just, <laughs> were just slaves and wanderers. Rahab was just a prostitute. Gideon was a nobody. Barak was just a guy following what was told to him to do. <laughs> Samson was just a self-absorbed narcissist. Jephthah was just the son of a prostitute chased out by his family, leader of scoundrels. David was just a lonely shepherd who was the youngest of his family who when they went off to war, he wasn't even in, uh, called. And Samuel was just a small child left in the temple of Israel, in the temple, or in the tabernacle of Israel. Temple of Israel, sorry. And so we look through and we look at these people with their faults and we look at the people that God chose and the only question is, what is your excuse? Because we go through and we look at these people and they're flawed. They're flawed, weak people. These are the type of people, if you're making a hero for a story, these are not the people you pick. These are not the people you say, yeah, they're going to succeed. But God said, these are the people I'm going to use. These are the people that I'm going to use to change the world. These are the people that I'm going to use. And these people who were nobodies, these people who were thieves, these people who were prostitutes, these people who were criminals, these people who were just everyday people trying to live their lives, God used them. And so much so that they became recorded in, in this list in <coughs> Hebrews 11 as the people that were champions of the faith. Because there's one thing that tie all these people together. At some point in their life, they understood that God said, you've got all these faults, you've got all these issues, you've got all these problems, but guess what? I'm still going to use you. And when God said, I'm going to use you, they said yes. The difference between these people being somebody that was recorded as a champion of faith, somebody that changed the world, and not, is when God said, I'm going to use you, whether they said yes or not. And it's today as you're sitting there... You may be saying, well, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, I, I'm a Christian. I don't know if God's calling me. Well, guess what? I can tell you by Scripture. God has already called you. The last message Jesus had on earth was to His church, to us as a people, to go therefore and make disciples. God has already called you. God has already said, you are to be sent out. You're to be a light on a hill. God has already called you. God is already saying, I'm going to use you. The average person, the person that may not have, uh, may not look like the person that you think that somebody needs to look like, God has already said, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you to reach the lost. I'm going to use you to reach those in need. I'm going to use you to fix the broke, to help fix the broken. The only thing that's standing in the way is our excuses. The only thing that's standing in the way is our excuses as to why, God, I can't. Not me, God. That's the only thing standing in our way. What excuses do we make? I work too much. I'm retired. I don't know enough. I don't have enough education. I don't know Scripture well enough. I've got a family. I'm too old. I'm too young. God, I can't. I can't. I can't. And God is sitting there. He's saying, you're right. That's the point. You can't. I can. And if you will just say, yes, God, I understand and I know that I can't, but I know that you want to use me anyway. I will. Then God will use you to change the world.
so often there's, and I know that there are probably people in this room that have been using that excuse with God their whole life. I know there are probably people in this room that have come every day, come on a regular basis, and they hear Brother Gary or they hear one of us sharing the gospel. And God is saying, you know what, I'm first I'm calling you to is I'm calling you to accept me. First thing I'm calling you to is come to repentance and become a Christian. And you do the same thing. You're saying, no, God, here's all the excuses why. I can't, I can't, I can't. And God is calling those people today, if, you're, if that's you, God is also calling you. You're saying, you've been saying, I can't for so long. And God is saying, the only thing that's standing in the way of me saving you is you. And for those Christians, we, some of us have been doing that for so long. We've been saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, when God is calling us. And the only thing standing in the way is our excuses. What is God calling you to today? What is God calling you to do today? The, <laughs> as Jonathan and the musicians are heading up this way, That's the question for us this morning. What is God asking of you? Have you, been to, have you been giving just excuses? Have you been standing in the way of God using you? Because God has shown us throughout Scripture, God showed us throughout His Word, God showed us throughout all these people and all the things that He did through these flawed and weak people. God showed He can use you. Will you keep making excuses today? Or will you say, Yes, God, I know you can use me. Please stand as we sing number 307.